Thomas Barricus <laughs> is the only Viking working at Bay Company. They killed the others, officially. Officially. All right. Thomas works in the infrastructure team, but doesn't like to be called an operations person. And he'll get to that in a second. Thomas. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my talk tonight wasn't very clear uh, on the website because I think I wrote that uh, description to uh, one of the organizers while I was actually on vacation and I was under the influence. Uh, oh, right. So, so I mean, at least what I'm going to be talking about is Ansible and how you use it to generate system files to run Docker containers. So it sounds like buzzword heaven. <laughs> anyway, a little bit about me, as Kim uh, pointed out. Uh, I work at Vekam. Um, I work there as the uh, technical lead for the infrastructure team, um, which entails uh, basically doing yeah, all the infrastructure, of course, and everything that enables our scrum teams, which are mostly containing uh, developers, enabling them to work. So making sure they have the dev environments there, making sure that our continuous deployment pipeline like, always works. And uh, yeah, that's a short, uh, the short version of what I do. Um, so, a little bit about Vekam. Is there anyone here who doesn't know Vekam? All right. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, you're also not really the target audience, because I think our target audience is like uh, women between yes. 30s and 40s with kid children. So, <laughs> I don't see too many of them here, but there are a couple of names. Um, Anyway, what we do, what we are, is essentially a, an online warehouse. Uh, it started all the way back in like the 1950s or something. I'm not the best one to talk about the history of Wacom because I worked there for six months now. Uh, but they have people who have worked there for 40 years and uh, they're celebrating their 40 year uh, anniversary and stuff like that. And then they're going off to retirement. Uh, what we do have is uh, we're a big online warehouse and we sell pretty much everything, but our biggest focus is uh, fashion, as you can see. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. <laughs> uh, we also sell electronics, we sell uh, things for your garden, we sell furniture. The thing is started out as being, uh, you could buy beds and then pay it off over a long time, uh, by actually filling out a piece of paper and sending it in by mail, and then you get a couch back. Um, anyway, with Big Cup, in I think 1995 already, they built their first online web shop, which is quite early on. Uh, however, it was essentially an HTML page, which then expected you to have a CD ROM for Big Cup, which contained all the pictures. And that's how you got your. <laughs> 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 so you would order the CD, it would come to your house, you would put it in, put it in, and then yeah, load up the website, and that way you actually had images. It, uh, Got developed a little bit after that, of course, and the current state, which is already legacy in my head, is uh, an in-house data center which we run in Swalla itself. Uh, all the infrastructure runs in VMware. Um, the underlying servers is all uh, Microsoft-based. There's some. Uh, that's not completely true. We have a lot of Unix and mainframes as well, but as for um, the yeah, application to warehouses and stuff like that. This is the website itself. Uh, the current website is built in .NET 4.5, which they switched to like, I think three or four years ago. Uh, MS SQL, and it's one big monolith. And it's, um, yeah, making new deployments there is tricky business. It's essentially having a team of guys going through the entire source code, uh, which is many lines, I don't even know how many. But it's a tedious process. Let's do a single, a single change to anything on the website. So, what we codenamed our new infrastructure as is Blaze, because it's blazing fast, of course. Uh, it's built on something a little bit more modern than, than the rest. Uh, again, it's going to sound like password bingo, but it's, it's what we're using. Uh, so, the infrastructure and everything surrounding that is all built in AWS. On top of that, we're using uh, Mises and Marathon for uh, scheduling our microservices. Um, all our microservices are wrapped and built with uh, Docker. 
Uh, all our backend stuff is in Scala, except for a couple of um, a couple of services that, due to how complicated they actually were, uh, weren't possible to port yet to uh, Scala. So they're still running in .NET. Um, the front end part is all Node.js. Then we have Cassandra running in the back, and as I said, it's microservices based. So, just a very simple uh, look at how the, an, a single environment would look. So this would be, for example, a development environment. It would be AWS on the bottom, EC2 instances still. We don't rely on services from uh, Amazon to do like uh, their container service and stuff like that, because we want to be able to switch to any other platform if we want to. On top of EC2, we then have pieces of Marathon. And on top of that, as microservices, then we have uh, all the Scala and Node.js applications. And to the back, it then has Cassandra Elasticsearch and much, much more. I could paint a much bigger picture, but we're going to keep it simple. Um, so what do we use Ansible for? Basically, everything you see on here, except for where I put the red thing. Uh, but the thing I'm going to be focusing on tonight is the EC2 part. So that's essentially just, uh, you should look it up as well. Uh, I'm clearly boring. So. Wow. <laughs> All right, moving on then. Uh, so why system D? Uh, is there anyone here who knows what system D is? <laughs> yeah, who doesn't know what system D is? <laughs> well, that's also fine. I'll tell a little bit about it. Just we'll do another raise of hands. Does anyone know? Or do, is there anyone who doesn't know what Docker is? Okay, that's surprising. I think everyone, should, everyone knows it by now. Uh, it's like the buzzword, uh, the main buzzword out there. Anyway, System D is uh, simply put a way to manage your services, which is running on a Linux machine, where you can specify uh, dependencies and uh, startup groups and orders and stuff like that. Let's put it simply. Docker is uh, a very revolutionary product, uh, which is essentially, well, it's not super revolutionary, but it's just become more mainstream now to actually build containers and run them. What you do is uh, building a, yeah, a Docker image, so to say, is essentially wrapping your entire application in one little box, uh, a container and being able to ship it to your host where it would run full OT. That's what they say. So, why wouldn't we just use uh, a, Docker uh, a Docker module in Ansible to just you know, run uh, Docker from there? Well, first of all, we lose all the benefits of systemd, which is, if anyone actually likes systemd out there, there are many of, uh, particularly how easy it is to write, and how easy it is to uh, maintain a system default if you want to quickly change something. And uh, basically you get a whole logging with it as well. So it's very easy to log from the Docker container to uh, the output of, uh, of, uh, of the journal. And the second biggest problem is that you can't easily define dependencies. So if you have one container that depends on another one, it's hard to specify in there, okay, this one really needs to start first, and then you should start this other one. So if you actually have it in a running state, running Ansible might break everything, because then a container goes down, which then kills all the other ones, but you don't actually know it's killed. Uh, yeah, that's why we went for system D instead of uh, just Ansible for us. But that then left us with another problem, because Ansible, which is a configuration management program, um, is quite, uh, yeah, handy to use if you're using it for everything already. So, we still did that. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, thought to himself, all right, a system D file is a very short file, it's quite easy to read or to write, and it just contains a couple of variables everywhere where you just define your service, essentially. Uh, my colleague is Bas Tichla. Uh, you can tweet him at here saying how awesome he is. And he uh, works for uh, Knots, which is a subgroup of Sega. Uh, but he uh, works with me at the Vcom as well. He's a really, uh, really, really cool engineer. Uh, so if you have uh, any really complicated questions, you should always ask him. 
after you ask me. So what services do we run like this? Well, here's the list. So it's everything that's actually not uh, required for a website, so not a website microservice, but services that we use to keep our hosts alive and to yeah, uh, do everything on the line. So anything that's infrastructure related, we try to dockerize and then uh, use system needs to manage with. Is this readable all the way in the back? <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it readable. Uh, so if we start out by first showing how a, um, a file is built, uh, a system D file is essentially quite straightforward. Uh, is there anyone here who writes Python by any chance? <laughs> Are you familiar with Jinja as well? Using Jinja for template for uh, using variables and stuff? Uh, so this is and it, this is basically what the template looks for us to be fun. So what you see here, first of all, is uh, a variable. This is the name part. Uh, the other part of Jinja 2 that's really cool is that you can do um, basic stuff like for loops and if else statements and stuff like that. So it makes it quite straightforward all of a sudden to describe your service and what you need. This is readable, by the way. To make it more readable. Um, so just to quickly go through it. Here you get the name of the container. This is set in Ansible. I'll show you that as well later. Um, here you've already stated your requirements. So by default, you'll always require Docker in order to run this container. So Docker, of course, is always in here by default. Uh, and then basically, you have a an if statement just looking, OK, is there anything that's actually required? Then go through that whole list and put it in there afterwards, and put dot .service after it. Then there's also a before statement, which means, all right, does it need to start before something else? Does it need to start after something else? Then you have uh, specific binds that it uh, might need. There's also once. Then there's the service itself. <coughs> um, so basically, this is the most uh, interesting part. Essentially, what it does is it goes in and makes sure that you kill off the old container before you do anything else. Next part is it removes it, so it. Yeah, and then you make sure that you get rid of the old stuff, basically. It pulls it uh, again from the duck hop. Here's another if. If there's a, anything uh, post that needs to happen after that, there could be some kind of configuration, something else that needs to be restarted. <coughs> and here is essentially just the part that you need to start the Docker container. This is what you would normally just do with a Docker run, but instead you describe it uh, in system D instead. So you have Docker run. You add the name of it. We then have uh, labels uh, for team, but it's only if there is a, a label set in the uh, configuration file, which I'll show in a bit. Um, else, just use team purple, which is our team. We just have colors for names. We're not that creative. Uh, yeah, label it, stuff like that. Then the interesting part is the Docker options, which you, if you've used Docker, are used to writing a long list of stuff with. <coughs> um, yeah, basically still the same. And that's the end of the first file. Next up is an example of how it's then built up. This is all you need now to basically create a Docker container and uh, push it to your machine and uh, make sure it's has all the things it needs. So all I do here is just give it a name. Uh, it should include the role that I just uh, described before, which is the <laughs> Docker system, system D role. We're going to name it Nginx. It should be Nginx running on uh, Alpine, the stable version. And then you add a couple of Docker options, which is just the host name of the, of the, of 
the machine. What uh, network it should connect to, so we have host or bridge or main other modes. And what ports it should be published to. And attack, just for fun. So now, all I will need to do is run a playbook, which just says, uh, on all my Docker hosts, become uh, root, and then use this role. So that's the Nginx role that I just showed. So what I have for that is a Vagrant box, which just has Docker and systemd installed. Just to show I'm not cheating, I'm just going to make sure it disappears first. So I'm here to demonstrate that I'm not cheating. I'm just going to SSH to the machine. Uh, we're just going to first look at if there is anything called uh, Nginx. No, it's not there. So we also can't start it. Um, so, do we have Docker installed? Yes. So, in principle, that should be all. Um, so, now if I just run my playbook. So, create system default for, the, for uh, Nginx. Done. Create system default, yes. Reload system D. Okay. Call the container. Uh, you can see it pulling the different um, file layers. And it finishes. Starting the Nginx service afterwards. Uh, restarting it if it needed, but it's not needed. Uh, so. That means Nginx should be running somewhere. Let's start by first confirming that it's actually there. That's good. Surprise. Um, so, just to show you the end result of what we just created, uh, if I now navigate to where it's supposed to be, we have an Nginx service, and if I open that up, oh, <laughs> uh, you can basically see it took the variables. All you set in the in the playbook for um, for Nginx is just variables. That's all you're passing to it, and then the other role essentially does everything for you. So it takes the name, which is just Nginx. There's no other requirements. It just needs Docker. It should start after Docker is running. Always restarts, and here you can see it inputting Nginx everywhere, and that it should pull the correct image from the Docker Hub, which is the stable Alpine version. <coughs> After that, it's uh, essentially just a uh, Docker run command that's being uh, being done, which makes sure that it gets published to port 80. So that means that we should see a website if we go there. That's the one. So it's just a simple uh, Nginx, nothing fancy at all. But this is, of course, just an example. Um, you could do a lot of other things with it. For example, I can imagine some people saying, well, oh, Ansible. Who the hell wants to use that crap? You could use uh, console, have all your variables set there, and use console template to go over it, and build your files like that. It's basically just taking Something that's somewhat complicated to get up and running, and uh, with as few variables needed, you can quickly scale it. Uh, so whenever you have a new service you want to roll out, it's essentially just filling out one file with these few variables, and then you're done. Then you can have your yeah, brand new container running. And that's it. I don't have any questions slide, but you're welcome to ask questions. You mentioned you use uh, a Samaritan. Yeah. Why use systemd as a scheduler? Uh, we are planning on, well, we're using Metis Marathon for all our website uh, services. So everything that's required for the website itself, we use Metis Marathon for. But, for example, we 
put Mises and Marathon in a container and run it. So there you would use this indeed to manage it. I wouldn't recommend doing it, but that's how we did it for now. So system D is, well, yeah, a sort of scheduler, but for where we don't want to, yeah, it's basically we don't want to roll out a Mises cluster to run uh, DNS masks on it. It doesn't make any sense. Because you want DNS masks running on every single host you're running um, in order to be able to reach the rest of the services. Why did you choose Ansible? Ansible, um, it was really, it was, it was, yeah. The decision was made before I started, but I was very happy with that decision. I actually never used Chef myself. I used Public before, but uh, Ansible is very easy to write. Uh, it's very easy to get started with. It's it's push based instead of pull based, um, which has my preference. Uh, there's such a low overhead to get started with it, so you just basically, from my local machine, I run my playbooks, and from that I can set up a whole uh, development environment in like uh, one hour. No agents. Uh, just a follow-up question on the Ansible. There's a section of time that we saw good for Ansible and people saying like similar things, but then they said actually in practice they have problems when it's scale. So you, like, you know, it's fine if you have 10 servers, but you have 100 servers, Start speaking with your cloud servers, you might have a problem. This was a year or two ago, so I don't know whether that's still true. I'm not I think there was a point in time where Ansible had some connection issues once uh, you started getting over 50 servers concurrently. Um, we currently <coughs> roll out like 200 servers at once with this, but not we have without having any issues. Okay. That's not the servers, but everything being installed. Yeah. Um, you said that you use the containers mostly for the infrastructure stuff, but not really for the website part. Oh, for the website part as well, definitely. But yeah, we just we schedule it in a different way. Uh, we basically have um, our, te well, our, our Scrum teams just built a uh, container image as well. But they use a build tool we have for it, which is then run on Jenkins. That does all the building, all the testing, and all the deployment of it. And it gets deployed to uh, Mesos using Marathon. Marathon is a scheduler you can use for Mesos. It's just a framework for that. So we do use Docker for that as well in production. Yeah? Um, do you manage some stable services in this principle? For example, Cassandra. Uh, yeah, we have state outside of the containers. Um, I'm not sure how we did Cassandra, but. Uh, it's, it's, we essentially just load and modules, so we make sure that the state is kept separately off uh, the container itself. That way you can yeah, do whatever you want with the container and you have your state running separately. Yeah. Anyone else? <coughs> All right. Good talk, Thomas.